In spite of the overwhelming technological power of the British Empire, the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879 proved to be more than just a simple bush war, as was so commonly experienced within the vast domain of the colonies, with the British factions completely underestimating the skill and tactical genius of the indigenous Zulu tribe, who proved to be among the most fearsome and ferocious fighters of the entire African continent, and saw the imperial troops of Lord Chelmsford take an initial bloody loss at the Battle of Isandlwana, the worst defeat of a colonial power to native forces in modern history. The Anglo-Zulu War began in January 1879, amidst rising tensions between the British forces of the Natal colony and the independent state of the Zulu kingdom, as ruled by the charismatic monarch Quetzalcoatl. the Natal colony having been established in May 1843, when the British annexed the Boer Republic of Natalia from the original Dutch settlers. The presence of these two mighty powers, which were divided by the Buffalo River, leading to a near-constant string of border disputes across the decades, while their presence was also seen as a significant threat to British rule in the Natal colony eventually culminating, during December 1878, in the delivery of an ultimatum to Quetzalcoatl from the British colonial officials and the commander-in-chief in South Africa, Lord Chelmsford, who demanded that the Zulu king surrender a group of his tribesmen accused of murdering a party of British subjects. Quetzalcoatl's lack of a satisfactory response, seeing Chelmsford declare a state of war between Britain and the Zulu kingdom, effective from January 11, 1879. Chelmsford while an officer experienced in fighting against African tribes, was not prepared for the aggression and tactical abilities of the Zulu. His previous encounters with natives, such as the Hosha people, giving him the incorrect illustration that the indigenous people were only equipped with primitive strategies and weapons that meant they could be easily routed by the far superior technology and might of the British. Chelmsford dividing his force into three columns, with the 90th Light Infantry under Colonel Evelyn Wood crossing the Buffalo River into the north of Zululand, the 3rd Foot under Colonel Pearson approaching from the south, and the 24th foot, under Colonel Glynn and accompanied by Chelmsford, together with battalions of the Natal Native Infantry, Natal Irregular Horse and Royal Artillery, crossing the Buffalo River at the mission of Rourke's Drift. The main objective of the British being to march straight to Quetzalcoatl's principal kraal at Alundi, joining Pearson's southern column for the final assault, while a company of the 2nd Battalion, 24th foot, remained at Rourke's Drift, which formed the advance base for the column. Immediately, Chelmsford's campaign got off to an uneven start as his original intention to attack the Zulu kingdom with five columns was curtailed to three due to a lack of troops, while the absence of roads and tracks across the hilly countryside meant ox-drawn carts proceeded at a slow, deliberate pace, the supply convoys of the centre column being particularly exposed, which meant Chelmsford had to expend large amounts of men and resources, mounting defences in the hills above, to ensure a Zulu ambush didn't occur, compounded further by heavy rainfall that caused the rivers and streams to swell, and left the oxen and carts bogged down in the mud. Chelmsford deciding to establish camp at Isandlwana Hill, which was approximately 10 miles inside Zulu country, and was visually distinguishable by its rock formation that was likened to a crouching lion. While away from the British advance, Quetzalcoatl mobilized his Zulu armies on a scale never seen before, with up to 24,000 warriors being mustered to repel Chelmsford's invasion, the Zulu force being divided into two groups, one heading to intercept the southern column, while the other made straight for Chelmsford's centre column. On January 21st, Major Dartnell and a troop of mounted reconnaissance made first contact with a sizable force of Zulus, leading to a running battle that lasted into the early hours of the next day. Chelmsford, upon receiving word from Dartnell, ordering the bulk of his army, including the 2nd Battalion of the 24th Foot, the mounted infantry and four guns, to be marched out into the field so as to engage the Zulu warriors in pitched battle and destroy them, leaving Colonel Pauline with the 1st Battalion of the 24th Foot to defend Isandlwana. Chelmsford being unable to locate the Zulu tribesmen, and thus sent his forces to undertake a fruitless search of the nearby hills, all while the Zulus had bypassed Chelmsford's army and made straight for the now weakened defences of the Isandwana camp. The first indications of a potential Zulu assault on the camp itself being made when tribal scouts were seen on the hills to the northeast and then to the east. At around 10 a.m. on January 22nd, Colonel Durnford, under orders from Chelmsford, arrived with his mounted column to reinforce the Isandwana garrison who were promptly sent to root out the Zulu scouts spotted in the hills east of the camp, the pursuit of which inadvertently led to the mounted division encountering the main bulk of the Zulu army, and thus led to a frantic running fight between the retreating mounted volunteers and Zulu warriors who had not been able to organize themselves into their traditional battle formation, the left horn, central chest, and right horn. One of Durnford's volunteers riding back to warn Pauline at camp that Zulus were advancing in force on their position, and thus a defense was mounted to meet the threat. Pauline, together with his officers, not appreciating the scope and size of their enemy, 
and thus did not demand that Chelmsford return with all haste to the camp in order to repel the Zulu advance, believing that his own troops, together with those of Colonel Durnford, would be enough to finish the job. All while the Zulu tribesmen rapidly slashed their way through Durnford's volunteers, who retreated hastily back towards Isandlwana, the main chest of the Zulu approach being halted by Pauline's battalion, and they were forced to go to ground. The main threat to the British position, however, were the horns of the Zulu assault, with native warriors racing to find the end of the British flank and envelop it, the British right, comprising companies of the 24th and the Natal native infantry, being unable to fight off the Zulus as they overran their positions, with other Zulu attacks being able to infiltrate between the companies of British foot and the irregulars commanded by Durnford, the problems compounded by an inconsistency of ammunition supply, which, while not affecting the main bulk of the 24th foot, was a major issue for Durnford's irregulars on the extreme right flank, who ultimately ran out of ammo and were forced to withdraw back to the camp, thereby leaving this crucial part of the defence wide open, the collapse of the right flank leading the Zulu chiefs to order their warriors of the chest forward, which rapidly unseated the British defenders and forced them back to the camp. The Zulus, easily able to outrun the retreating British, rushing between the withdrawing British centre as the horns moved in from the sides, causing a complete collapse of the British line. Individual groups of soldiers staging desperate last stands against the Zulu warriors until their ammunition ran out, after which they fought with knives and their bare hands until being overwhelmed and destroyed. In the chaos of the retreat, only mounted troops were able to escape before the horns of the Zulu attack closed in, after which the road back to Rourke's Drift was cut off and thus forced the survivors into the hills, where they were systematically hunted down and killed, while a group of 60 soldiers under Lieutenant Anstey were cornered on the banks of a tributary of the Buffalo River and eventually wiped out, the final action at the Battle of Isandlwana taking place along the banks of the Buffalo River itself, where groups of Zulu warriors from the Horns cut ahead of the British and hunted them down as they attempted to slowly ford the flooded river, even instigating Natal natives on the opposite bank to take their side and kill the retreating British as they emerged from the water, the most memorable part of this retreat being the attempts of Lieutenant Melville and Lieutenant Coghill to rescue the Queen's colour and not allow it to fall into enemy hands, the swollen river seeing Melville swept off his horse, while Coghill, seeking to rescue Melville and the colour, had his horse killed from under him, leading to the colour being washed away on the current, while the two officers were executed by Natal natives. With the deaths of Melville and Coghill, the Battle of Island Luana was brought to an end at around 3.30pm on January 22, 1879, although only an hour prior, a total eclipse of the sun had taken place, that had plunged the battlefield into an unsettling darkness, perhaps an omen as to the upcoming British defeat, the losses on the colonial side being 52 officers, 806 non-commissioned ranks, and 471 African volunteers, against approximately 2,000 Zulu casualties, while from the carnage, around 60 members of the British faction were able to escape back to Rourke's Drift, word eventually reaching Chelmsford late in the afternoon that the camp had been taken, and his column returned to the site during the evening, only to find a scene of absolute devastation. 1,000 rifles and the reserve ammunition supply having been taken by the Zulus, while the next chapter of the wider war was visible from his position, as away in the darkness could be seen the mission at Rourke's Drift burning from a Zulu assault, Chelmsford having overseen the worst loss of a colonial power to native tribesmen in military history. The siege of the Rourke's Drift mission was actually unintended by the Zulu king Quetzalcoatl, being instead instigated by his younger brother, Prince Dabulamanzi Kampande, as he attempted to cut off the British retreat across the Buffalo River, the Prince's regiments having not partaken in the main battle at Isandlwana, and thus sought to achieve their own triumph by capturing the British base at the Rourke's Drift Crossing, which was manned by a single company of infantry from B Company 2nd Battalion, 24th Foot, which, though designated a South Warwickshire regiment, was comprised largely of Welshmen, the company colour sergeant being Frank Bourne, while the sole officer in the company was Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead, the mission itself being the property of Swedish Reverend Otto Witt, and had been repurposed for the use of a store by the British Army, while his house became a military hospital under Surgeon James Reynolds, also present with B Company, being Lieutenant John Chard of the Royal Engineers, who had arrived at Rourke's Drift on January 19th with a party of zappers so as to create a bridge across the Buffalo River. The first signs of trouble at Rourke's Drift on January 22nd came when distant gunfire was heard, followed by the arrival of mounted troops retreating from Island Luana, word of the camp's total destruction being made aware to Chard who immediately knew that a Zulu assault was likely to occur, and thus began to fortify the mission, with tents being struck and stored, and the buildings loopholed for defence, while the store and Witt's house were linked by a wall of mealy bags, a surviving party of Durnford's unit arriving soon afterwards, and were posted forward to fend off the Zulu advance for as long as possible, 
so that the fortifications could be completed, Durnford's men being engaged at 4.20pm by the Zulu advance, forcing their retreat back to the mission, before immediately departing for the nearby Natal town of Helpmakar so as to muster reinforcements, 500 Zulus appearing around the hill to the south and running towards the mission station, but were repelled by heavy fire at a distance of 50 yards, forcing their attack around to the northwest but this too was resisted by the British defenders, thus driving the warriors to ground. Not long afterwards, the Zulus again approached in force from the west and northwest, successfully breaching the western fortifications and seeing Zulu warriors enter the mission hospital, leading to the heaviest fighting in the siege as patients inside sought to ward off the enemy, all while the hospital was set ablaze and rapidly burned down. Privates John Williams, Henry Hook, William Jones, Frederick Hitch, and Corporal William Allen all receiving Victoria Crosses for their actions in defending the hospital and evacuating as many patients as they could, fighting room to room with bayonets against the Zulu spears once their ammunition was exhausted, not all of the patients being able to escape and were either killed in the assault or perished in the fire that burned well into the evening, the light from the fire being helpful to the British defenders as with continued wave after wave of attacks from the Zulu tribesmen that lasted up until midnight, it helped to illuminate the battlefield. In the end, the main body of the Zulu attack fell away at around midnight, though fighting continued sporadically until 4am, the British at Rourke's Drift by this point only holding the area around the storehouse and could have been easily overwhelmed. A large body of Zulu warriors appearing on the hill above Rourke's Drift at 7am, but no further assaults occurred due to the arrival of Chelmsford's column from the ruins of Isand Luana, forcing the natives into retreat, Chelmsford relieved to find the mission still alive, having only suffered 17 killed and 10 wounded, against approximately 500 Zulus killed, while 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded to individual defenders, along with a number of other decorations and honours, VCs being received by Lieutenant John Chard, Royal Engineers, Lieutenant Bromhead, Corporal William Allen, Privates Frederick Hitch, Alfred Hook, Robert Jones, William Jones and John Williams, Surgeon James Reynolds, Assistant Commissariat Officer James Dalton, and Natal Native Contingent Corporal Ferdinand Sheesh. Subsequent to the horrendous defeat at the Battle of Island Luana and the triumph of the defence of Rourke's Drift, morale within the British forces invading the Zulu Kingdom was at its very nadir, and Chelmsford's column was entrenched along the Buffalo River in a purely defensive position to ensure the Zulu army didn't mount an invasion of the Natal colony. Although this would prove not to be the end of the British invasion, as to the north, Colonel Evelyn Wood led his own column into an area of the kingdom, as occupied by the Abakalusi, a tribal group vigorously loyal to Quetzalcoatl and led by the enterprising Prince Mblini Wamswati, would ordering one of his senior officers, Lieutenant Colonel Redvers Buller, to undertake a recon mission into Zulu territory in order to scout out any enemy positions on January 20, 1879, leading to their first engagement with the tribesmen that resulted in a running battle as Buller was forced to retire. On January 21st, Wood's army moved south out of his own encampment in order to engage the Zulu warriors forcing them to retreat to the most prominent peak of the northern mountain range, Lobaini, where they would establish a stiff defence, only for Wood's march to be stopped two days later when word reached him of the British defeat at Island Luana, Wood considering that a large Zulu attack force may be en route to intercept his own column, and thus he abandoned the operation and moved north to a new campsite away from the main Zulu army on a plateau at Kambula, where the ground sloped away on two sides, this position being fortified with wagon walls and trenches and an earthwork bastion was built on a small hill in the middle of the camp, the potential attack of the main Zulu army not immediately materialising, and thus Buller returned to undertaking raids on the local Zulu encampments. On March 12, 1879, the British took yet another severe blow from the Zulus, when a supply train of wagons and oxen became trapped in the flooding waters of the Intombi River as it approached Lundberg, thus making it easy prey for an attacking force of 800 Zulus who overwhelmed and destroyed the supply train the Intombi disaster leading Wood to launch a full attack on the Lombaini Mountain stronghold, partly at the instigation of Chelmsford, who needed a distraction to the north so as to draw the Zulu army away from his own column to the south, Buller leading an attack group of 950 mounted troops against the mountain, while the Zulus, who knew the area intimately, prepared to trap the British force, word reaching Quetzalcoatl of this British advance to the north, and thus he dispatched the main Zulu army to push back Buller's raiding party, arriving in the middle of the raid, which had seen Buller's force take heavy casualties and was only able to escape the closing horns of the Zulus in the nick of time, Buller having lost 12 officers, 80 men, and an unrecorded number of native irregulars in the ultimately fruitless assault. Emboldened by Buller's defeat, the Zulu army moved to attack Kambula itself on March 29th, 
though Wood's army was prepared thanks to the information of a Zulu defector, who told him that the Zulu force would attack around midday, as supported by patrol groups reporting the approach of the tribal army. The British force mustering, with a defensive strength of 1,200 men of the 1st 13th Light Infantry and the 90th Regiment, together with 800 other irregular troops, while ammunition reserves were established along the rear of the lines. Wood's artillery comprising four seven-pounder guns, two mule-borne guns, and several rocket troughs, the Zulu chiefs being hesitant to repeat the mistake of Rourke's drift through a direct assault, and instead desired that rather than taking on the British at a heavily fortified position, they should instead draw Wood out into the open by threatening the Natal border, though the Zulu warriors on the ground, enthused by their various victories, were in no mood for such caution, taking up their traditional battle formation and commencing the attack at around 1.30pm. Though their advance didn't go as planned, with the left horn becoming bogged down in marshland to the south of the British camp, while Buller was dispatched to engage the right horn prematurely and thus not allowing all of the Zulu sections to be in place before the main attack was meant to begin. Buller's feint worked perfectly, as with the right horn moving in towards the camp, the 90th Light Infantry, defending the north face, opened fire in devastating volleys once the mounted troops were clear, destroying their offensive and putting the survivors to flight. The decimation of this threat to their left flank, meaning Wood could focus more of his troops into defending against the chest and left horn of the Zulu assault. The left horn, having heard the start of firing against the right horn, rushing up the south face of the hill at the foot of the camp, whereupon they were met with heavy fire from the 13th Regiment, though the Zulus were able to counterattack using Martini Henry rifles captured at Izandluana. The Zulu left horn and chest continuing to push against the south and northeastern flanks of the British camp in wave after wave, until finally withdrawing at 5.30 p.m with Wood ordering Buller to exact his revenge for the previous day's massacre at Albany by allowing his mounted division to chase down and destroy the Zulu warriors in merciless fashion over the course of many miles. In the end, the Battle of Kambula saw 83 British soldiers killed against 3,000 Zulu warriors and proved to be a devastating blow to Quetzalcoatl's ability to defend his borders from the British advance. Jamsford's column crossing the Buffalo River in order to aid the fortified position of Colonel Pearson's South Column that was isolated at Ashoe, deep in eastern Zululand, leading to another major Zulu defeat at the Battle of Gingin Lovu, where following Chelmsford's capture of the Royal Kraal of Gingin Lovu on April 1, 1879, 11,000 Zulu warriors led an early morning assault on the British position, Chelmsford's occupation of the high ground, meaning he was able to achieve an overwhelming victory against the Zulus after only an hour of fighting, with only six officers and 55 men killed under his command against over 1,000 Zulu warriors this triumph coming as something of a redemption for his earlier failure at Izandluana, and opening the way for him to relieve Pearson's force. Though somewhat contradictory to Pearson's appraisal that the fortified camp at Eshoe would provide a perfect advance base for their final assault on Quetzalcoatl's royal kraal at Alundi, Chelmsford ordered a retreat to Tugela, intending to establish a base nearer the border river. While it appeared that the Zulus had driven the British back to the Buffalo River, the reality was that thousands of their warriors were now dead while the horrors of the calamitous Battle of Izandluana had given the British government the impetus to dispatch reinforcements to the Natal colony, while Sir Garnet Wolseley would replace Chelmsford as commander-in-chief in South Africa. Chelmsford, by the middle of April 1879, preparing to invade the Zulu kingdom again with two cavalry regiments from the King's Dragoon Guards and the 17th Lancers, five batteries of artillery and 12 infantry battalions, thus comprising 1,000 regular cavalry, 9,000 regular infantry, and a further 7,000 men with 24 guns, including the 1st Gatling Battery, to take the field for the British Army, while the Zulus could only muster 24,000 warriors who were rapidly losing morale against such a terrible loss of life and the fact that they were surrounded on all sides by strong British columns that could not be repelled with the remaining number of fighting men. The advance of Chelmsford's 2nd Division finally began on June 1, 1879, but was again not without controversy, as on the same evening, he was informed that Louis, the French Prince Imperial, son of the deposed Emperor Napoleon III and a graduate from the Royal Military College at Woolwich, had been rounded and killed by Zulu warriors while carrying out an advance patrol, leading to a major outcry in France, and Lieutenant Carey of the 98th Regiment, nominally in charge of the patrol, being tried by court-martial, though he was ultimately acquitted. While on June 6th, the nervousness of the British Army was demonstrated when a false alarm saw 1,200 rounds of ammunition wasted on a non-existent target until the anxious troops could be brought under control. Such was the pervasive sense of fear and intimidation that the Zulu warriors had instilled in the British forces, though eventually, by the time General Sir Garnet Wolseley arrived in Cape Town on June 28th, Chelmsford had moved his two columns to within 17 miles of the Royal Kraal of Alundi, 
where Quetzalcoatl, who had sought to avoid war with the British to begin with, attempted to negotiate for peace, but was conscious of the fact that, should Chelmsford demand unreasonable terms for surrender, he would need a suitable force to undertake one last stand against the British at Alundi, buying him time to build a significant army of warriors, which were ultimately necessary when Chelmsford set out terms that were immediately rejected by the Royal Council. On July 3rd, Colonel Buller, again on a scouting patrol, encountered a Zulu ambush and barely escaped annihilation, followed the next day by Chelmsford moving his army towards Alundi, whereupon, at 9am, the Zulus attacked in strength, the British adopting a hollow square formation comprised of Gatling guns and artillery on the edges, while regular infantry and the cavalry took up position inside, essentially creating a human tank, the sheer magnitude of British fire being so great that Quetzalcoatl's army was put to flight within half an hour lances emerging from within the armed squares to pursue and break up the fleeing Zulus, thus spelling the end of the Zulu army and leaving a clear road into the Royal Kraal at Alundi, which Chelmsford ordered burned, the Zulu chiefs gradually surrendering across the kingdom, while Quetzalcoatl himself was captured on August 28th and forced into exile in the Cape Colony. The British, victorious in the Anglo-Zulu War after five months of fighting, establishing a new regime in Zululand that was absorbed into the Natal colony from 1897, which itself disappeared in 1910 when the wider Union of South Africa was created, thus sowing the seeds of what would become the modern nation of South Africa. Ultimately, the Anglo-Zulu War illustrated the best and worst aspects of both sides, the British initially showing a complacence to their native enemies that was struck down in devastating fashion at the Battle of Isandlwana, and thus led to the British commanders adopting far more radical defensive and offensive strategies so as to overcome their fearsome rivals while the Zulus demonstrated almost immediately their ability to fight and defend their land with an almost superhuman ability that was even able to overcome the modern tactics and technology of a mechanized colonial army, only for their emboldening in the wake of victory at Isantlwana, to see them undertake wasteful, needless and disorganized campaigns at Rourke's Drift and Kambula, sacrificing thousands of great warriors that could not be replaced, while the British reinforced themselves with shipments of troops from the UK and other colonies, thereby putting the tribesmen firmly into withdrawal and leading eventually to the loss of their kingdom to the rule of a new British power.